Hey everyone, it's Jenna. Before we get to this week's episode, I want to let you know that we are running a listener survey in partnership with our colleagues in the Democracy Group Podcast Network. We want to know why you listen to Democracy Works and the other shows in our network and how we can make the content we bring to you even better in the new year. You can access the survey at democracygroup.org slash survey. Everyone who completes it will receive some Democracy Group Network swag. Again, that's democracygroup.org slash survey. Thank you for taking the time to fill it out, and I look forward to hearing from you. From the McCorney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. Today, we are joined by John Hibbing, who is the Foundation Regents Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska, and the author of a new book called The Securitarian Personality, What Really Motivates Trump's Base and Why It Matters for the Post-Trump Era. And this is a, a very timely book, and I, I'm glad we had the opportunity to have John on the show right now. I, I think a lot of folks are wondering what is going to become of Trump supporters once Donald Trump is no longer president. And uh, I think we, we all agree that this book offers perhaps a deeper analysis of what motivates the president's base than we have seen in a lot of news stories uh, about talking to Trump supporters and diners and, and these sorts of things that have been so prolific over the past couple of years. He's offering us a way of thinking not about who they are. He, he spends valuable space going through how conventional understandings of the demographics, for example, and some of the attitudes of uh, Trump supporters are not so much different from other Republicans, but instead he focuses on what they want. And that's how he comes up with this notion of securitarians. Right. And, you know, so so there's plenty of theories, right, presented by varieties of sources, academic, journalistic, you name it, about, uh, you know, who this Trump voter is. And right, they go to diners because we're, we're thinking that this is a group of white working class people who feel dispossessed by the contemporary economy. Or we think it is um, rural people who are put off by the cultured elite or whatever, right? And Hibbing, who I agree with you, I mean, you know, I've learned from his work as well, is arguing that there's something deeper and really kind of, of fundamental within yeah. uh, the human psyche that uh, that Trump has kind of connected with and, and appeals to him some very deep level. Yes, and other, and others have as well in the past. And I mean, what I what I kind of find interesting here, it it's become a you know a question that we've talked about and and others about what kind of happens the way Jenna framed it this way, right? Like what what happens to the Republican Party and Trump support going forward? And I I think to to really think about that, you need on the one hand to think about Trump and what's going to become of Trump and what role he's going to play in the party and what sorts of political elites might be able to adopt some of what he's been able to do and maybe even do it better. But then you also have to focus on whether or not the supporters of Trump are sort of uniquely committed to him in almost a cultish fashion, which has been suggested by some, or if there's more to it. And if there's more to it, then it suggests more longevity and uh, more permanence uh, for the Trump for what Trump's put together. And I, 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 I think that's where Hibbing comes down. He's yeah. saying that there's something really foundational about the Trump supporters. But the idea that that this is all kind of distinguishable from the, this, you know, the cult of personality around Trump, I, I doubt that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be very difficult for the Republican Party to extricate itself from this Trumpian affirmation of a yep. significant portion of the population. I mean, you're seeing it already, right, in Georgia, where the head of the RNC is saying, no, 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 you all have to go vote. Well, we, <laughs> despite the fact that Trump is telling them that, that the election was was stolen. Right? Sure. Um, and so I just I, I I don't know that that lightning can strike twice. And I don't think 
uh, Trump is going to just, you know, magically get off the stage. Well, no, but I mean, it depends on whether you're taking sort of a shorter or longer term perspective here. And I, I, I read Hibbing as suggesting we take a, a much longer term perspective. And so sure, we're, in, we're in the middle of Trump's efforts to still discredit the current election. Right. <laughs> so we are very much wrapped up in the cult of Trump right now and and will be for the next you know for for some period of time although you know there are some out there i'm thinking of mike murphy in particular a republican strategist one of the big lincoln project people who's been arguing uh, actually lincoln project or republicans for biden whatever it was is saying that uh, once you take away the oxygen of twitter and once you take away the powers of the presidency once you take away air force one trump won't be that important anymore but what i do think we have to recognize is that Trump has demonstrated a couple of Mm -hmm. things here about the potential for an authoritarian-oriented leader. Now, now Hibbing makes a lot of pains in this book to argue that Trump supporters are not authoritarians. And I don't think we need to argue that point one way or the other, but the fact is Trump is, right? I mean, Trump is in much of what he talks about and much of what he's advocated. And I think he has shown for future elites, many of whom are going to be much more competent than he is and are going to hire much better people than he has, that you can really push the guardrails, you can really push the norms, uh, that there is a willingness among a core base of the Republican Party to tolerate authoritarianism in its leadership so long as it's delivering on this set of issues which Hibbing is arguing is so deeply important to these people. There are certainly, you know, lots of considerations about what this group looks like moving forward. And I think John's going to talk about it in the interview. There are also, I think, some big questions and concerns about what this all means for a democracy that I think you guys will pick up on in the last part of the show. But for now, let's go to my conversation with John Hibbing. John Hibbing, welcome to Democracy Works. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm happy to be with you, Jenna. So as we think about President Trump's supporters, they've been referred to as racists, as fascists, terms like that. But your book, The Securitarian Personality, argues that while some of these things might be true for some of Trump's base, the thing that really unites them is this securitarian mindset. So to start things off, John, what does it mean to be a securitarian? Well, um, it, it is a word that I wanted to use to contrast with authoritarian, which is the the most commonly applied phrase, I think, to Trump supporters. But uh, my notion of a securitarian is somebody who really desires security, but a very specific kind of security. It's not security from climate change or uh, coronavirus, uh, things that are are uh, non-personal, but rather it, it applies to human beings. It's, it's bad guys. It's outsiders, people who aren't like us. Uh, and the securitarians have a very specific idea of who's an insider and who's an outsider. And it's just what you might imagine, the kind of core American, you know, uh, Christian, long-term, patriotic, uh, probably white uh, individuals. Uh, those are insiders. And anybody who's an immigrant or a protester or a Colin Kaepernick or, you know, from, from another country, these are outsiders. And so the security they desire is not a generic form, but it is security from these uh, embodied uh, outsiders. Yeah. And so how did you arrive at, at this this definition? Was it something where you kind of went into this this research and this book project with this this idea in mind? Or did it come about through the, the, the work that you did for the, the book and your related research? Yeah, good question, because actually it is a little bit of a shift for me. I had a previous work where I, I guess, in conjunction with a lot of political psychologists, agreed that people on the right tended to be just a little bit more uh, worried about security and, and uh, fearful of, of life in general, of, of anything negative, uh, disgust, or, or any, anything that they would worry about. You know, in, in a way, this is a narrowing of the focus. I think uh, I, I, that's not true, in my opinion, that 
that conservatives and now especially I'm focusing on Trump supporters are just generically more fearful. Some of the survey items I had was, are you uh, worried about uh, natural disasters or death or clowns, you know, any kind of non-political generic thing. And actually liberals tended to be more concerned about those generic things than uh, than conservatives and especially Trump supporters. But then, uh, you know, the more I looked at the survey data, the more it became clear that when you focused on things like the might of foreign countries such as China, immigrants, people taking away your guns, uh, you know, anything that, that really represented these impersonated uh, outside threats, that's where it was. So uh, it, it is a little bit of a shift for me. And it did, to answer your question, it did evolve from the, the focus groups and the surveys, the national surveys that I did for this book. And it's also been interesting to, to think about, you know, how much of this was kind of deliberate on the part of, of Trump and his campaign versus, you know, how much of it was just his natural personality that these folks just seem to to gravitate toward. Do you, do you have thoughts on that? You know, how much of this was was intentional versus what's just innate about Trump himself? I do have thoughts. And in my opinion, this, this is Trump. You know, I, I, I don't agree with those who say, oh, he's a clever guy and he's really, you know, got his finger on the pulse of this. And he said, I can, uh, I can play with these people. I think, I think securitarians are very astute at sizing up people who are with them and people who are against them. And they can spot a phony. And, you know, they thought, let's, for example, John McCain, Mitt Romney, the most recent uh, non-Trump Republican presidential candidates. I don't know if they thought they were phonies, but they didn't think they were truly securitarians, regardless of their record on on immigration. And they look at Trump and they say, here's a guy who feels it in, in his bones. And I think this is this is why they resonate with him. You know, I go clear back to Donald Trump's actions with regard to the Central Park Five. You know, long before he became a political figure, he was spending his own money to claim that these five African-American uh, youth were, were guilty when, when they were exonerated. And, you know, so I, I don't think he's putting on airs at all. This, he's, he's not playing a game. He's not playing a role. This is Donald Trump. And I think if he were playing a role, I'm pretty sure that a lot of these securitarians would be able to spot it. Yeah. And so was it the case that prior to Trump in the, you know, uh, Mitt Romney, John McCain era, even maybe going back to, to Bush or, or further than that, that the that the Republican Party kind of kept these securitarian forces at bay or tamped down? I think you'd have to go back to George Wallace, who really wasn't running as a Republican in 1968, to find somebody who I think would tap into these securitarian tendencies the way Donald Trump has. So these individuals are voting. They care about politics. They weren't completely you know, isolated from the political regime, but boy, they, they didn't really... Uh, identify and uh, resonate with the Republican candidates the way they have with with Donald Trump. So I think, you know, it was a, a bit of an uneasy alliance. They were there. Yeah, sure. Certainly the Republicans were speaking to them more than the Democrats, but nobody really spoke to them the way Donald Trump has. One of the things that we saw in the most recent election was an increase of support for Donald Trump from African Americans and Latinos. Um, do you think that this is a a case where you know some of these folks are coming into this securitarian tent, or they're kind of being welcomed in as insiders? I do. Um, yeah, and, and then thank you for bringing that up. That's a point that often gets missed. But yeah, if you think about it, if I'm right that this is a kind of evolutionarily deep thing, there's no reason that there should be massive differences in the degree to which people are securitarian, depending on whether they were Hispanic, African American, white, you name it. And so uh, I think that's true, but obviously, um, African Americans, especially, and Hispanics to a lesser extent, have been strongly supportive of Democrats more than Republicans. Well, I think a lot of that is simply because if you are yourself an outsider, it becomes pretty difficult to to buy into the Republican agenda. But if you look at their actual beliefs, in which I, I did in one of the chapters of the book, uh, if you compare the, the beliefs of whites, blacks, and Hispanics, it's amazing the extent to which blacks do have some fairly securitarian attitudes. It's not just... Things like on uh, abortion and and gay rights, which have kind of long been noted that that African Americans were not as supportive as as white Democrats, but it goes deeper than that. And all, some of the questions that I like to ask about how important is it for a country to be strong, blacks are much more likely than whites to to say that it is important for a country and for an individual, by the way, to be strong and to be vigilant and all these kinds of things that I use to measure securitarian personality. So. 
yeah, and I think what, what might happen is as racial and ethnic minorities become more accepted into the mainstream, then I think it's going to kind of allow them to display their, their securitarian tendencies. So it didn't surprise me a lot that you saw a little bit of a drift from uh, racial minorities toward Donald Trump from 2016 to 2020. Yeah, and I, I want to come back and, and hit on some of the implications for what that might mean going forward. But before we do, you know, to, to bring democracy kind of more, more directly into this conversation, we've talked about uh, on the show before our Mood of the Nation poll, which um, looks at, at different aspects of public opinion. And one of the questions we asked recently was, you know, how do you feel about democracy? How would you describe democracy? And we saw you know, many responses come in from people who I, I identified as Republicans, as conservatives, saying, well, we're not we're not a democracy. We're we're a republic. Usually that was accompanied by something like dummy or, you know, you idiots or something after at the end of, of those responses as they came in. But reading this, it, it seems to me that um, democracy is really not important to securitarians at all. They don't really see themselves as part of, of a democracy or, or, or democratic citizens. Is that a, a fair characterization? Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions in the survey that I kind of liked. One was, uh, if you had a choice between uh, living in a democracy and living in a secure society, which would you do? And Donald Trump supporters, or I call them venerators, uh, heavily came down on the side of, of security. Liberals, moderates, and even most conservatives who were not Trump venerators didn't agree with that uh, nearly as much. So I think this is an important point. I call them situational Democrats or situational authoritarians because I don't think they automatically want to live in an authoritarian society. Trump supporters don't really like to be told what to do. I think we've seen that with regard to the mask mandates and things like that. They resent that. So I think I understand why the word authoritarian is used so often, but I, we have to be careful with it because it does imply somebody who wants to to follow authority. And my line is that they only want to follow an authority figure who is setting a clear security agenda. And if you know they didn't exactly like the authority of, of Barack Obama when he was issuing executive orders, so or they didn't like Gretchen Whitmer when she said you got to wear masks in Michigan. So I, I think it's it's very situational. Uh, they will support democracy if their guy, their leader, is somebody like them, if they think that democracy is producing a set of public policies that are strongly protecting of uh, gun rights and, and reducing immigration and things like that. So the key point, though, is that democracy is just a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't think there's a lot of strong commitment. In fact, there's really very little commitment at all to democracy in and of itself, just as a, a way that we a way of governing and as something that we need to venerate and protect uh, because it's fragile. So I guess for people like folks listening to the show who are interested in and concerned about the, the health of, of American democracy moving forward, do you see ways that you know you, we might be able to, to frame democracy in, in a way that, that is perhaps more appealing to these folks? Or, or is that even a, a worthy way to spend our time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's a bit of a long shot. I do think, you know, one of the things that I hope might come out of the book a little bit is the sense that that there might be ways that we can speak to each other a little bit more effectively. I mean, one example that comes to mind is with regard to climate change, I think the more we just simply say to these Trump supporters, you've got to do this because we have a moral obligation to to save the planet, that that doesn't work at all. They don't they don't buy that. But if if uh, threats to the environment become actually threats to the United States, and you know the U.S. military has said that on many occasions that climate change is a threat to global stability and United States security, that's the kind of argument that they they would buy and that I think would be able to make some headway. Uh, with regard to democracy itself, yeah, I just I think for them. Security is such a necessary thing. It's it's an existential issue. Uh, they need to protect core America, and if we don't do that, then they're not going to buy it. And and if they're convinced that democracy doesn't do that, which really, I mean, democracy doesn't. If you think about it, we we don't know what the leaders are going to do. They might they might have a securitarian agenda. They might not. And uh, I think that's a non-starter for them. So I guess I have to sound a pessimistic note on that. That we're ever going to kind of kind of convince Trump's base that democracy in and of itself is something worth fighting for. Do you see a universe in which the, the securitarians could do their own thing? You know, if the GOP puts up another Mitt Romney type of candidate they don't agree with, is it something that's strong enough and organized enough and, and coalesced enough to, you know, break out on its own? 
I think it does have the potential to break out on its own. I don't know if it's because they're organized so well, but I, I guess uh, I think one of the big dangers for the Republican Party right now is that these security first kinds of individuals will break off with Donald Trump. And I think it's it's less because of the policy stances, because uh, one of the things I emphasize in the book is that actually a lot of Republicans, even those who aren't what I call securitarians, have a security issue as maybe their second or third most important issue where, you know, abortion or uh, high taxes might be number one. So, you know, it's, it's not a coalition that is really at odds with each other. So I think that's, that's the good news for the Republican Party. Most people who are Republicans because of, uh, you know, social warrior kinds of beliefs or economic beliefs are kind of on board with the security agenda as well. So I think that's, as I say, the good news. The bad news is, I think Donald Trump himself and the extent to which people have really locked on to him. And so imagine what's going to happen in 2024 if if Donald Trump or one of his family members or, or very close acolytes is not the nominee. I think having had their guy in the White House for four years, it's going to be very difficult for these ardent Trump supporters. And I'm not just talking about Trump voters. I'm talking about the ones who you know, are really, uh, really wrapped up in him. I think it's going to be very difficult for them to be enthusiastic about anybody else. So uh, you know, it could go a couple of ways. I, th- I think the, the policy basis is there for a continued kind of uneasy coalition on the right. But Trump's personality and, it, it, you know, he's just not the kind of guy that is going to be happy with anybody else in the limelight. So I think the extent to which his followers uh, stick with him as he becomes maybe a little bit more of a, a, a burr in the saddle of, of the Republican Party, that, that certainly could potentially spell some difficulties for them. Yeah. Did did you um, at all in your your work cover you know sources of of information? I think we we've also seen that that this group of folks is particularly vulnerable to conspiracy theories and and these types of news sources and and types of arguments. Does this kind of have to do with the fact that it's they see the the mainstream media as outsiders, whereas somebody on YouTube, if they perceive that they're an insider, they're they're more likely to to believe what what that person is saying, regardless of whatever factual basis may or may not underlie the the claims that that person is making. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we all really would like to believe certain things, even if we might kind of think they may not be true. I think we're seeing that a lot with the election right now. Um, You know, I think deep down, a lot of people on the right kind of recognize that Trump lost, but, you know, it's sure nice to believe that some of these votes were fraudulent or things might be questionable. Um, you know, I think that happens on the left as well. I don't know, maybe not as much. It's hard to say exactly. So this is what psychologists call motivated reasoning. And I think it's it's a serious problem for the human condition. Um, you know, I think sometimes we make too firm a distinction between what is fact and what is opinion. Um, it, it should be that way. We should be able to make a hard and fast distinction. But I, if you're just talking about the way people work, how they're wired up, I'm afraid that for them, that that dichotomy is not entirely accurate. And I think there are a a gradation of things that we kind of know maybe deep down aren't true, but we really act like we believe them. There's been some kind of fascinating research done in psychology where they'll ask somebody, one of them that I recall he used was, uh, did Barack Obama shake hands with Ahmadinejad, who was a former uh, Iranian prime minister who was a Holocaust denier and all kinds of things. Uh, And he never did, of course, but people on the right would say, yeah, he did. Uh, but then they, in another branch of the study, they'd say, all right, well, we're going to give you $10 if you give the correct answer here. And did Obama shake the hand of Ahmadinejad? And then they say, well, no, he didn't. So I think that's – and it, it happened on the left as well, by the way. So so we all kind of like to believe these things, and maybe there's really no danger in our minds to playing along with this, even if you know when push comes to shove and there might be some monetary incentive to giving the correct answer, we actually know what it is. I, I think that's uh, an aspect of human nature that's very troubling. Hmm. Oh yeah, and it, I mean, it also you know when we have this fractured media landscape, it also becomes problematic for democracy when there's not that kind of shared set of facts and understanding. I know this is also a point that's that's been covered widely uh, um, among political scientists and you know media scholars and those those types of folks. That's right. Yeah, it, it does really play into that. So, you know, in the past, we haven't had the opportunity to just indulge these kinds of inclinations that we have. I do think it's important to recognize that we've always had these, but uh, now, and that's why I don't, you know, I, I don't, I think we could take away Fox News and, and One America News Network and, and all the rest, and we'd still have a problem. Mm-hmm. But that's not to say that, that these things are, are irrelevant. They certainly have 
created a kind of feedback loop um, that, that uh, certainly exacerbates these divisions that we've been descri- describing. Sure. Uh, and that actually brings us back around to how, if at all, Democrats can work with the securitarians. Um, I think there's maybe two different approaches out there. One is the you know, quintessential Joe Biden, you give a little, I give a little, we'll, we'll meet in the middle and, you know, compromise somewhere. Neither of us will get exactly what we want, but we'll each get, you know, 75% or what have you. The other is maybe the idea coming from the more progressive wing of, of the Democratic Party, which is like, no, we should double down on progressive ideas and either build our own base that's bigger than Trump's base or convince folks that, you know, maybe if there's, there's a way to wrap some of these progressive policies in a, a different fr- framework that they might actually be be appealing to some of these these Trump supporters. What do you think about the the best path, if either path, is opposed to to move things forward? Yeah, you anticipated me. I'm actually gonna gonna argue that neither of those is going to be very successful. Yeah, with, with all due respect to Joe Biden, I don't think that. You're ever going to appease the people on the other side, uh, the, the securitarians. They're never going to be able to accept what he is about. And so in that sense, uh, this may sound odd coming from a political scientist, but yeah, I'm not a big believer in deliberation. I think these sentiments are so deeply wired that – uh, and that doesn't mean they're genetic, but it certainly they've kind of become physiologically instantiated. And we have these very deep feelings, both on the, the securitarian side and the other side, which I sometimes refer to as Unitarians without a capital U, not the religious denomination, but the people who kind of see the world as all people being the same rather than insiders or outsiders. So in that sense, I just don't think we're going to talk the other side into agreeing with us. On the other hand, I don't think that means as you kind of uh, describe the, the Bernie supporters that we should just go uh, all the way to the left and and um, try to kind of outdo the securitarians on the right. I think we need to compromise. It's just that this compromise should come not in the context of deliberation. It's not that you convince me you're part right and I convince you that I'm part right. Uh, we, do, we have to compromise because we think the other side is just fundamentally wrong and because they're not going to go away. Uh, you know, regardless of what happens to Trump in the next few years, this group is going to be there and calling them racist and, and, and ending there is not going to do any good. It's not going to make them any less racist. So I do think we have to consider the possibility, as distasteful as it is for all of us, that and, and securitarians need to buy into this as well. We need to kind of meet in the middle on a few issues. The good news is that on a lot of these securitarian issues, there is a middle ground. I mean, we we probably are going to have to have immigration levels that are less than a lot of liberals would want and more than a lot of securitarians would want. But I think we can do that. And if you recognize how deep these feelings are, these predispositions on each side, then to me, it suggests that there is going to have to be a little bit of compromise, not because we think the other side is part right, but just because we recognize that that this is an element of society that's not going to go away. Yeah, or, or you know, maybe there are policies that seem to be, you know, broadly um, appealing to everyone. I'm thinking about marijuana legalization, uh, a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Both of those passed through ballot measures in 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 a couple of states. This most recent election, and and so maybe the, I don't know is is that a, a viable path forward? Finding issues where there is broad support, and then maybe moving to some of these things where there's there's more disagreement, perhaps. Yes, no, you're you're good. Uh, not necessarily broad support, I guess, but I would say let's try to think about issues that maybe don't cut along these these lines of I'm a securitarian and you're not. You know, things that don't have directly to do with identity and groups. And I think there are a lot of issues like that. And you know, Madison talked a lot about cross cutting cleavages, and I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. Let's let's get some cleavages that might mm-hmm. might lead to agreement uh, on the part of securitarians and unitarians. And you you've mentioned a few interesting ones that I think have possibility. I, I noticed one of the editorials in the Washington Post this morning was about the possibility for a kind of pro-family agenda for Joe Biden. And I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, parental leave and things like that. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of ways that I think securitarians could buy into that. So I, I like your idea. I think if we look carefully, and, you know, that's not going to, the root divisions are still going to be there. But I think if we could, could mute them a little bit by focusing on these issues that don't cut across these hot button uh, identity kinds of, of, of issues, we'd be a lot better off. One last question, uh, John, here before we, we let you go. So what do the securitarians themselves think of this framework you've created? Have you had a chance to follow back up with anyone that you met or, or talk with as part of putting this, this book together? 
Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I have had uh, some of it has come. You know, I haven't had a chance to do a systematic thing, but you know, hopefully the book will be read by more people, and I'll have more of a chance to do that. But I did inflict it upon some students that I'm teaching this semester. I had a course on the 2020 election, and uh, several of those. I live in Nebraska, so uh, one of the nice things about that when you teach teach here is that I've got a good mix of, of really liberal students, moderate students, and and several strong Trump supporters, and they were mostly were okay with it. Uh, one or two. Th- had the position that that they just wanted freedom that that's that uh, the the strong Trump supporters were were really intent on that they didn't like to be told what to do which kind of squares with what I'm saying in a way um, that and going against the authoritarian vision which is that you know just tell me what to do because I love structure in my life uh, but it is a different argument that I'm saying they want to be they, they want this freedom in order to be secure and and they're saying it's just freedom in and of itself. But I don't think that's entirely true. I guess I'd push back a little bit on my students' arguments because uh, it seems to me there are some freedoms that the that Trump supporters really don't like. Abortion would come to mind first, uh, but there are lots of others that would fall in that category. So I think uh, to me there's an agenda there, and and the notion that the government would stop them from being able to carry arms and defend themselves. That I think is just a, a total non-starter for them. So I think it's it's. I agree with my students to some extent that they want freedom, but I think they want it in order to uh, to protect themselves, their families, and their core American vision. My cheery view is that maybe this was a stress test, and that I think we're in the process of passing it. But uh, it's a stress test that I wish we didn't have to have have endured. But uh, you know, the cheery view is that maybe this challenge to democracy that we've seen with uh, with the Trump. A race and the aftermath to the election, uh, I'm hoping that we might be able to come out of it a little more strongly than we went into it. But that that could be looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. All right. Well, uh, John Hibbing, thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to visit with you, Jenna. So, Michael, you know, I'm listening to John's argument and, you know, it recalls other stuff that you and I both know that he's written on. And it's this kind of notion that a lot of what we take to be partisan choices really comes down to our, not a partisan makeup, but just kind of our genetic makeup in terms of these fundamental questions. And, and particularly this idea of, of security, right? Right. And it's so, deeply wired. Right. And so, you know, we're going back 150,000 it, years. Wired in Savannah, and so there's some group looming on the horizon. And how do you evaluate that group? Do you welcome them and bring them on in and say, you know, what do you, where's the water buffalo? Or do you shun them, run away, or do you immediately go and attack them? Right. And, and this is so deep and so entrenched that there is little to be done about it, right? This is, this is like changing your hair color or whether you're right-handed or left-handed. And, you know, to do to some degree. Right. Um, and so Ch- it's changing your hair color these days, Chris, is actually easier than changing whether you're left handed or right. Yeah. Well, temporarily anyway. Right. Yeah. So but the point is, if he's right about this and this came out in Jenna's interview, what is democracy for? Right. I mean, he says he just doesn't have a lot of hope for deliberation. And, you know, I mean, if democracy is indeed an argument with a marketplace of ideas and we're going to have this free exchange and come to a point where the, the, the truth is great and will uh, prevail if left to herself. I think that's the Jefferson phrase. If that's not true and if we're arguing in places that we're just never going to connect on this genetic level, then what is democracy and how does it how how should we understand this process? You know, what's new, I think, about a lot of the work that people like Hibbing do is that they try to root some of these differences or cleavages within society uh, deep within our psyches and deep within our genetic makeup and deep within evolutionary patterns as opposed to, uh, you know, sociologists of the 50s who who might have found it to be more in the distribution of wealth or or land ownership or, or something along those lines. But the point is that there are these deep conflicts in society. And what politics is often about is the extent to which a party system will embrace that conflict by mapping it, or they will negate the conflict by not mapping it. And what I mean by mapping it is that one side, one party takes one side and one party takes the other side, as opposed to Trump, 
whose genius was in recognizing how to exploit that cleavage by emphasizing this sort of immigration issue in such a way that it clearly placed him and the Republicans on one side. So what hit me was saying is that these two sides aren't just going to deliberate around something, right, that's so deep-seated. I think that's kind of how mm-hmm. I'm understanding your understanding it. But where the politics come in is do the parties and do elites choose to bring these issues in and make them what our politics are about, or do they cover them up by not making them about? Yeah, I grant – all the points about you know Trump connecting with, identifying, and exploiting the the kind of the zeitgeist that we're in right now. But what I don't want to lose sight of is that this is a moment in world history, not just American history, right? The parallels between and we've talked about this, right? We've talked about Orban and Erdogan in in Turkey and Bolsonaro in in Brazil, and they're all reflecting a very similar kind of securitarian argument. That so not only to the depth are of it. These, these dimensions chronic, ever-present in human politics, but right now there's a receptivity, a feeling of threat maybe um, for you know whatever reason, because this, this predates COVID, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's just important, I think, to see this as both perennial and distinctive right now. The, the reason also I think that that this is so bad for democracy is not only uh, this notion that, you're, that you and, and Hibbing talked about, uh, this notion of deliberation, but also because the securitarian appeal is so strong, and he shows this empirically, that people are well willing to overlook democracy in order to get the security. Mm-hmm. And and I've seen this in, in other studies too, like it coming out of the, the Bright Watch project. They've done some nice work on this as well, showing that in the name of security or some other things, people are willing to sacrifice democracy. Right. And and we've talked about this, right? I mean, if you see the other side as at minimum abetting this existential threat, if not uh, fully in league with this existential threat, then you're not going to look with equanimity on you know them winning an election or you know them ha- holding political power, and so you are inherently more willing to uh, bend the rules or cheat or lie right. in order and, to get what you want. Right, but this 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 kind of thing, like what we're seeing right now, and when we talk about Trump's power going forward. It's not about the entire Trump coalition because the Trump coalition includes evangelicals. It includes what uh, Hibbing refers to as the uh, the Tea Party people. Includes some other some other groups as well. This is a big part of it, but it is the core. It is the primary electorate core. The reason that Donald Trump will exercise power going forward, if he does, will be because of his control over this primary electorate part of the Republican Party, the securitarian part of the party. Now, somebody else may come along who's able to speak to it just as effectively. I am more confident of that maybe than you are, but that can speak to that as just as effectively and will therefore be able to win, you know, in these kind of primaries and that sort of thing. But but his power going forward and his threat to other Republicans lies not in his full coalition, you know, evangelicals are going to go with whoever promises the judges. They don't need Trump. But the securitarians need this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, my argument would be that, you know, yes, you're right. But anybody else, the idea they're going to get be somebody who's good at both of those things, I think is a hard sell. But, of course, it's possible. It can happen here in the uh, famous right. book. Yes, by, it uh, can happen here. All right. Uh, thanks to John and Jenna for a fascinating discussion around a really interesting new book. Uh, I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Chris Beam. This has been Democracy Works. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Our editors are Mark Stitzer, Jen Bortz, and Chris Kugler. And additional support comes from WPSU's Andy Grants, 
Emily Reddy, Chris Allen, and Craig Johnson. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please consider leaving us a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. All eyes are on Georgia as two runoff races could determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. I'm Stephen Fowler, and I cover politics for Georgia Public Broadcasting in Atlanta. I'm also host of the podcast Battleground Ballot Box. Join me Tuesdays as we look at how the fight for voting rights and who we vote for could change America. Subscribe at gpb.org slash battleground or anywhere you get podcasts. Podcasts.